Prof. Rianto? Pak Ari? Pak Ari ngasih ya? Oke, sebelum. Oke, ngajar, bis. Oke. Oke, kita mulai. Dimulai aja, Mas. Mic jam. Gak apa-apa. Masih mute. Suaranya kecil, Mas Mik. Masih mute. Mungkin nggak pakai headset bisa nggak? Soalnya kadang kalau pakai headset suka pindah sendiri. Oh ya, yeah. uh, sudah terdengar ya, Bu Is? Sudah, sudah. Alhamdulillah. Ya. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the Honorable Professor Rianto, PhD, as a Dean of Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Science, Universitas Islam Indonesia, and the Honorable Professor Is Fatima, as a Head of Department of Chemistry, UEE, and Honorable Dr. Lam Song Chenchom from uh, Prince of Songkla University, Thailand, and also Dr. Rudi Putra from Department of Chemistry, Universitas Islam Indonesia, as all speakers today, and also all participants. Uh, uh, in this webinar, as we know, this is a part of what class professor program. Yeah, uh, as part of what class professor program that held by Department of Chemistry, Universitas Islam Indonesia. Uh, this is a uh, maybe 14 uh, webinar of the series. And in this webinar, we have topic about chemistry for environment. Uh, before we start the webinar, I would like to share information about the rundown of this webinar. The first is opening, and the second is remark from uh, the Dean of Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Science, Professor Rianto, PhD. And the third is my agenda, a presentation of uh, from the speaker. And the last is uh, closing. For the first, let's we open this webinar with reciting Basmalah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, and the second is the remark from Professor Rianto as a Dean of Faculty and Mathematics of Natural Science. Uh, for the Professor Rianto, the screen is yours. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum. And good morning. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Head of the Department of Chemistry, Professor Is Fatima. The Honorable, the first invited speaker this morning, Associate Professor Rudi Shahputra, PhD. He is the head of the Integrated Laboratory. The Honorable. The second invited speaker this morning, Dr. Lem Tong Chen Chon from Prince of Songla University, Thailand. Uh, the topic of this uh, webinar is very interesting and very challenging because uh, this topic uh, related to chemical application for the environmental with the specific topic from two invited speaker is uh, treatment of wastewater, treatment of uh, soil waste. This is a uh, very interesting. 
the first invited speaker, Pak Rudi Sahputra PhD, will talk about uh, treatment of soil and wastewater using uh, combination of uh, pitu remediation and then entrapping zone and then uh, electrocoagulation electro method. This is a very good topic. And then the second invited speaker, Dr. Lentong uh, Chuan Chan from uh, Prince of Songla University. We will meet uh, with uh, Dr. Uh, Lim Tong in IC3PE yeah, in uh, 2018, yeah, Dr. <laughs> and see you. Uh, Dr. Lim Tong Chen Chen will talk about carbon-based uh, magnetic absorbent. It's a material for sustainable water treatment. And this topic is very good and very challenging. Okay, the next, uh, I would like to thank the support of this uh, webinar. The first uh, from uh, GEG. GEG is a global engagement grant. Uh, this grant from Universitas Islam Indonesia in 2020. The second uh, support from uh, WCP uh, from uh, Minister of Education and Culture Republic of Indonesia, a uh, world class professor from Professor Ispatima. And then uh, I would like to thank the webinar committee, special to Pak Mekdam and all committee. And uh, I would like to thank for all, all participants in this morning. We can see in Zoom more than 100 participants. Eh? Okay, Alhamdulillah. Uh, I hope this uh, webinar, this event, can be success and useful, and uh, all participants can discuss with uh, two invited speaker in this morning, uh, Prof. Associate Professor Rudi Sahputra, PhD, and then you can discuss discuss with uh, Dr. Lim Tong Chuan Chon. Yeah. Okay. Finally. Uh, Thank you very much for all, and I hope this. Uh, I hope all participants enjoy uh, this uh, uh, webinar. And finally, thank you very much for all. And uh, wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, thank you, Professor Rianto, for the remark. And the next session, uh, we have a photo session. Uh, so please to all participants can uh, on your camera and to Mr. Rizal, please uh, capture this screen. <coughs> Bapak Ibu, uh, mohon untuk mengaktifkan kamera uh, karena kita memasuki sesi foto bersama. Pada Mas Rizal untuk dipersilahkan untuk mengambil uh, gambarnya. Oke, okay, finish Mas Damar. Oh, finish. Okay, thank you, Mas Damar, for capturing the screen. And then, <coughs> uh, before we start the presentation, I would like to share information about uh, the rule of this webinar. Okay, uh, can you see the screen? Lihat, okay? Yes. 
Okay, th this is the rundown of our agenda. Uh, each speaker will have uh, about one hour to present the uh, material and then we'll follow by a Q&A session. And this webinar will be finished at 12 o'clock Jakarta time. And this is the rule of this webinar. The first is maybe you, it's kindly to rename your Zoom account by the format name institution and so we can catch your identity clearly. And the second, <coughs> uh, please register your attendance by filling Google form that we will share it uh, uh, after the session is start. And the third speaker will present the explanation firstly, it will be followed by Q and A session and participant can uh, give question and ask question to the speaker by writing the question in the chat box. Before the typing a question, participant uh, should add your first name and institution and your question. Moderator will select the question to raise to the speakers. In case you file to access the Zoom meeting, you can follow the streaming YouTube channel, Jurusan Kimia FIPA UEE, and the link for registration and chat for your response will be also recognized by the team. And the last, the e-certificate will be given after you join the session and fill the attendance form only. <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we will move to the main agenda. Uh, delivering presentation from the first speaker. Uh, now we have first speaker, Dr. Lam Song for, from uh, Prince of Songkhla University. But before we listen to the presentation of Dr. Lam Tong, I would like to uh, share information about Dr. Lam Tong. Here's the short information about Dr. Lam Tong. Uh, Dr. Lam Tong is uh, from Prince of Songkhla University, got the B BSc at uh, 2001, and then got master in Prince of Songkhla University, Thailand, and then obtained the doctoral degree in Justus Lipik University of Kishen. And Dr. Lam Tong have a research a topic about development of material for in environmental purpose. And now this is very related with our topic today. So uh, let uh, we invite Dr. Lam Tong to present the material. For the Dr. Lam Tong, screen, screen is yours. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot for, for let me in.
Halo, Dokter Lempang. Uh, Dr. Lemtang just informed me that the laptop is shutting down, so uh, just wait for a moment. Uh, laptopnya Dr. Lemtang uh, sedang shutdown. Nah, ini gabung lagi sudah. Because I have a problem a little bit with my with my computer. Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. Hear you. So sorry because I try to share screen and my computer so start to to shutting down, <laughs> and then so I have to reopen it again. So now I share you the screen, right? Uh, you can share the screen now, Dr. Yeah, I'm okay. now. Uh, just a moment. So you see it? Yes, Dr. Lento. Okay, yeah. But just wait a little bit, so because I'm I try to turn it on. Okay. Thanks a lot for your uh, nice presentation and yeah, very nice to meet you again, uh, Fatima and uh, Professor Rianto. So we met yes, last yeah. time with Rianto in 2018. Yeah, I remember. So this is a good thing that we can actually have the online presentation and online discussion and with so many uh, participants as well. Uh, but I don't what what I don't like about the webinar is that so I had no chance to go to Indonesia to enjoy the weather there. Uh, this is not good, right? <laughs> okay, but I hope the COVID situation will be better. Uh, I'm not sure if you can if you can actually hear me. Sorry, everyone. Yes, I hear you, but uh, your PPT is not shown yet. Okay. Okay. Is it clear? The voice or anything? The voice is okay, but the, the slide is not not yep. uh, appeared yet. Okay, because I start sharing already. Okay. Mm, you can stop share and re-share again. Yeah, yeah, I That's try. Right. Yeah. So what about this one? Yes, yes, good. Very nice. Okay. Thank you. Great, great, great. Yeah, uh, as I said, so it's, it's good that we can contact online, right? So, and, and always so we can have uh, as many as participants as we like by using the webinar. And this is what I like most about uh, technology. But what I don't like is that so I have no chance now to go to Indonesia because of the COVID. Yeah. <laughs> so this, this is not good. Okay. Uh, anyway, so thanks a lot, Fatima, for inviting me again to join your nice uh, event again for the webinar series of your university. And so I hope to, to join later and later if I have some uh, more work to uh, present to you or kind of uh, the things that I develop in my lab. And of course, I mean, so if we have a chance so we can actually continue our collaboration because so one may skip it still 
being written. And then so we will submit together, Fatima. Okay, thanks a lot for joining me today. And uh, the theme of the webinar today is also quite interesting and quite challenging to the um, present world now today because it led to environment. And so what, because, so on behalf of uh, the chemist, so what we could do, so we are not only the chemists who actually have to uh, publish a paper, but okay, we can actually distribute our kind of work to the uh, practical use. And then so they can actually get our idea and develop further to heal our world. And of course, so my topic today, so we be related directly to the um, environment. So this is how to treat the water treatment by using the adsorbent. And, but the adsorbent that I'm going to present today is related to what I have done and my team has done in my lab. So this is the carbon-based magnetic adsorbent. Okay, this is the topic. And so now, uh, just want to let you know that uh, we have no uh, the chemistry department anymore, but now, so, so we change to division of physical science. Uh, so next time, so when I use the slide, so I, I will change to this name. So division of physical science, but of course I'm, I'm still a chemist. I, 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 I still teach a lecture in chemistry. Okay. And I like this kind of banner a lot. And so when compared to the other, among the other, so I, I look so so cool, right? <laughs> because I, I wear the, the t-shirt while the others, so wear their uh, kind of proper clothes. Yeah, this is uh, actually my friend, so made a lot of joke about this to me, yeah, that uh, I look so cool and I look like a, uh, a star in a television or something like that. But of course, I, I, I like this a lot, <laughs> so it's just, it's just my style. Okay, thanks a lot for inviting me for this uh, nice webinar, especially the topic related to chemistry for environment. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the topic today. So this is actually related to uh, the things that actually recently happened um, in our country. This is the big problem in our country right now. Um, not only in Thailand, I think. So you also have the problem in Indonesia and some other country we, we, uh, they, that uh, they actually found um, face the, the same problem. This is the problem concerning the pollutant which actually releases into the water. So especially um, for the country who actually uh, make a lot of uh, like dye industry. So to do the clothes like in Thailand, so we export a lot of clothes. So we use a lot of dye, we use a lot of chemicals in the uh, pharmaceutical industry and also for the agricultural industry. And then so we have the problem that we actually release this kind of pollutant into the, to, to the water and to, to the soil, to the cow, and later on, so it releases uh, 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 finally into the, into the water system. And then so the, the, the people could not actually uh, uh, consume that kind of uh, contaminated water. So we have the, the, uh, the, the setup to clean up this kind of water before we release into the, into the environment. So this is uh, the big issue that we have to, to take care of. And of course, I mean, related to the environment issue, we have actually to uh, force the industry partner who actually produce a lot of this kind of pollutant from their own industry to remove first the, this kind of pollutant before they release the clean water back to the environment, right? Okay, 
So actually, when we talk about the treatment techniques that actually in the industry use, so they use a lot of technique, including the membrane filtration. This is like a big part of the membrane, like a thin film, uh, like a thin layer of membrane to filter the pollutant or they simply use the sedimentation because it is quite basic. And then, so they just add up some chemical into their, their, their system of water treatment, or they can also do the adsorption technique with actually quite simple. But of course, I mean, all of them still have their own uh, disadvantages. Talking about adsorption, uh, compared to the other technique. So why we are interested in adsorption more than the other two techniques that I just have mentioned? Because the first one, this technique is quite simple, right? It's really practical when they really want to use in the industri industry ponds. And they have very high efficiency they actually release the minimal secondary contamination into the system. So that's why it's quite interesting because so when you talk in the large scale industry scale, so you have to talk about the causes. If you want to use the membrane, so that means you have to spend a lot of money producing the membrane. You have to uh, use a lot of chemicals for the sedimentation and but a uh, lot of them seem to be not really uh, well practical yet. So that's why the adsorption is still the, uh, the good method for their industry because it, when you talk about industry, so you have to talk about money. When you talk about money, so they have to talk about reduction of their spending cost, something like that. Okay, let's see why we are quite interested in adsorption. So let's see here. Uh, the picture that I just point in. So this is the picture of the pond with actually it's like a, uh, for water purification in one, uh, in one factory in Thailand, not really in Thailand or in Taiwan. So I, probably I use the picture from the other country. So consider the adsorption technique compared to sedimentation or maybe filtration or the other technique. So you can actually see that so this kind of technique is quite convenient and can have also uh, give you the high performance. And for the design of the um, treatment unit, so it's quite simple, right? So compared to the sedimentation or membrane filtration, so it's quite simple. So it looks like simple because you just have one, con one big container and you put the adsorbent into your adsorption system in your, in your uh, treatment unit. And afterwards you just let it um, stir for some time or some days. And then so later on, so you can actually remove the, um, the adsorbent from the adsorption unit. And then so you have the clean water afterwards. So the motivation, if we talk about the adsorption, so that means we talk about the adsorbent. What the adsorbent means, it means the thing in the solid form, or especially in the gel form. So it can be anything in, but especially in the kind of solid. So you can use this kind of solid to adsorb the contaminant in water. When you put in the water, so that means it will adsorb if you try to interact with the chemicals that you have inside your water system. So that means you have kind of the pollutant in um, um, uh, in the uh, chemical ways that are dissolve quite well in the water. So the mean is it, um, they don't really um, precipitate quite easily in, the, in this kind of water system. So when you want to remove it, so you have to add up the solid thing into it, into the system, into the water, which actually contaminated. And then so the solid will start to interact with the contaminant. So we call the solid adsorbent and we call the contaminant or the pollution chemicals with actually dissolving water adsorbent. The, so, so far, so we have a lot of uh, uh, 
example of good adsorbent starting from silica, or you can move to metal oxide, you can actually move to, to the solid polymer, or you can also uh, simply start using the biomass derived carbon. Okay, talking about the carbon, so we have a lot of carbon. So you have the carbon material, which actually you are familiar with the CNT or carbon nanotube, you know the graphene, you know the porous carbon. And the porous carbon material is quite interesting and quite challenging compared to the carbon nanotube or compared to the graphene. Why we are quite interested in this kind of porous carbon? Just because, so they contain um, plenty of surface area. So they have a lot of internal porosity actually to use to host the um, contaminant molecules and because they also have the chemical stability. And of course, I mean, if we can have uh, this kind of car porous carbon actually derived from the biomass, this would be quite interesting because you also can reduce the cost of production. Because if you want to use the CNT carbon-based material or graphene carbon-based materials, they are also quite challenging at the moment. But talking about the large scale of treatment in the water unit, so if you spend a lot of CNT or graphene, so that means you have to spend a lot of money for, to produce this kind of two things, right? So that means the biomass-based carbon, it's still quite challenging and quite be interesting to the industry. So we talk about large scale, we don't talk only in the lab scale anymore at the moment, right? Okay. So it seemed to be the good material as I saw then, if you use porous material, and why I choose the carbon. And the carbon that I choose is in the form of amorphous carbon. So it's not look like the nice tube like in the CNT or carbon nanotube, or looks like a nice sheet like in the graphene. Yeah. So it look really nasty, I would say. But of course, I mean, it still contain a lot of uh, aromatic rings that you can see from this kind of picture. And when we talk about the aromatic ring, we can actually also can talk about the aromatic edge or the functionality. So because it's carbon, so that means related to the to the knowledge in organic in in, in organic chemistry. So that means when you make the carbon materials, when you want to functionalize it, you have to use the knowledge of the organic chemistry to do the modification. Why we have to do modification of this? Because we need some kind of specific functionality. Because this kind of functionality that's actually appear on this amorphous carbon, beside it have a lot of porosity or high surface area, is the fact that this kind of functionalities can be the active SOP chain size to host the SOP bed molecule. So that means if we have the proper suitable functionality, so that means you can actually increase the performance of your SOP chain unit, okay? So let's move a little bit to how could we actually derive or uh, to get the carbon form the kind of amorphous carbon. Okay, because so our country, yeah, both Thailand and Indonesia, so we are kind of the, uh, produce a lot of biomass from uh, agricultural products, right? So because in Thailand and Indonesia, so we, we, we have a lot of kind of, 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 um, of plant, so we grow rice, we grow the, uh, the, the, the coconut, we, co we, we grow actually a lot of kind of trees, we grow uh, the palm, we grow the uh, uh, rubber trees. So we have a lot of kind of these things. So we have the corn cob and everything. So of course, I mean, let's let talk about the biomass a little bit. So it's really generated for food consumption, right? For food consumption. And so uh, both Thailand and Indonesia, we actually like a big 
exporters for the food product. And of course, I mean, after this, uh, we plant this kind of uh, food product. And so we export into other country who actually could not grow them. And then so we actually have a lot of biomass uh, that they are left a lot uh, from the agricultural uh, things that we actually do. So let's talk about this a little bit. So move back a little bit to the assumption. Why we need to do the assumption and what parameters that we need to actually uh, be concerned. So we concerned about the assumption capacity because as much as the adsorbate molecule can be absorbed onto the adsorbent, this is the good thing to, uh, to, uh, to um, identify that our adsorbent work uh, uh, in the good way or not. And of, of course, we talk about the time of adsorption. So that means we talk about the adsorption kinetics. So we talk about how fast we can remove this kind of pollutant by absorbing it using the adsorbent. And of course, I mean, if we can do it quite fast, we can do the removal rate quite fast of the spent adsorbent from the water system. Because usually when you use the adsorbent in kind of fire powder, so you have to disperse it in the water system. But after what, so you have to, to remove the spent adsorbent with actually loads of lot of uh, contaminant already inside the adsorbent. So this is also that the, uh, we'll spend a lot of time to remove it from the water system, especially for the industry scale. So this is quite quite challenging for the, for, uh, for the industry partners who actually want to uh, do it um, with uh, a high performance uh, adsorption system, right? Okay, let's talk about the food a little bit because so I, I try to move a little bit into how we could actually derive this kind of the magnetic stuff, this kind of assault, good assortment and why we shoot this one. So we, we export a lot of food, especially so we we also transform the food into some other thing, like nata the cocoa. So I think Indonesia sells this one a lot, right? <laughs> so it's quite uh, delicious, not only delicious, but it's, I can see uh, can be also useful. So not only the coconut, which actually we can obtain. So we grow a lot of rice, we have the sugar cane, we have the corn, and um, all of them so contribute a lot of um, the large area production. So it, it estimates, especially only for the rice, um, so it's already 60 million acre. So it's quite a lot in, in, in my country. So that means, so from this stuff, and not only from this kind of stuff that we can use to make the assortment, uh, not only the, the bio waste product, but actually uh, from, the, from the agricultural products, but we can also have this kind of the species things like disgusting and not in, in, in annoying in edible species like water hyacinth, which actually is a big problem in our countries at the moment, right? Okay, so we turn, we will turn it into the carbon stuff. So when we talk about the bio things, so now in my country, and I, I, I think Indonesia as well, is it, it, this, this kind of uh, keyword is quite popular at the moment. So it's called bioeconomy. So the mean we don't sell our product in kind of food anymore. So we, we try to turn the bio waste stuff or biomass product into something that actually can have um, the more value, right? So we are the big exporter. So we have a chance to do this. So this, this is a kind of bioeconomy. So we have the big area for growing this kind of stuff. We have the suitable climate and of course, many other countries could not grow it, especially in the Europe or in the uh, America. So they actually could not do it. So we have a lot of kind of uh, the uh, diversity of the plant that we actually can use it to make the good absorbent or other 
kind of stuff on the material, it actually can can give you the in other application as well. Okay, so after the food production, so we have the waste which actually left, and because this one, the biomass or the bio waste, right? So especially for the one that actually, so after we get it. So let's see the price a little bit about when you sell the product in kind of sugar or in kind of uh, in 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 uh, the form of corn straws or in the form of rice. We get the sugar from the sugar cane, bagasi. We can get the, uh, from the sugar cane product, and so we can get the corn straw from the corn cob. We can get the rice from the from 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 the rice that we plant, and we have uh, something that actually can be left after. So we get the sugar, corn straw, or rice. So this is uh, there are, can be uh, sugar cane bagasi or corn cob or rice hack or rice straw. So that derived biomasses now are in the lower prices. So that means so they have no prices. So they are a little bit have the value at the moment because so there's some other um, scientists so use it for some other application. For example, like to make the furniture, to uh, burn it, to make the energy or something like that. But of course, I mean, still compared to the one big car from Germany, for example. So we still have the problem of this because so we have to to use it in a quite large amount and especially for the bio waste, so they are quite cheap, right? So that means we want to turn our product into some other things, stuff. So this is the term of uh, bioeconomy. Just let the student know this kind of term, this kind of uh, keywords. So about bioeconomy, we actually lighted on the use of agricultural biomass, including it wastes as a raw material. All right, so you can have a lot of things to make the good as something. You can start from the coconut shell, you can start from sugarcane bagasse, you can start from rice hulk, corn cob, water hyacinth. But what we want to make, as I said here, because also I talk about the theme of chemistry for environment. So that means we talk about how to make the asorbent, right? But not only the asorbent that we can make, we can also make a lot of stuff. It actually can have the high, higher value out of this kind of stuff. Like uh, at the moment, so they try to make batteries. They try to make the supercapacitor. They try to make things out of this. They try to make an um, fuel out of this kind of products. So they mean not only the asorbent that we are talking about it today, but we can use a lot of uh, um, uh, this kind of stuff to make a lot of things for for the other application as well. But of course, I mean, talk about talking about uh, the topic today, which actually related to the asorbent. So I'm sure that you are familiar with the uh, activated carbon, right? So because this is the, the, the old fashioned already, I would say. So it's the simple thing that you can actually can obtain. So you start from the biomass sources, you can use a lot of industrial residues, you can use the animal residues, you can use a lot of sewage, you can use a lot of agricultural crops residues, and you do carbonization uh, in, the, in the atmosphere or in some uh, um, like the inner air. And then you do activation, you put the chemical into it, or you do can do also the physical activation by using the carbon dioxide or the air to activate it. But especially for the, this kind of activated carbon that they actually use. So they produce it by using the toxic chemical or the high temperature, especially if, so you have to burn it more than 500 degrees Celsius and including the use of toxic chemical, especially the potassium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide, phosphoric acid or zinc chloride, right? Why they have to use that? Because they have to make a lot of porosity out of that. So they mean they burn things from their uh, carbon source product into their activated carbon. So that why this called activated carbon because the term activated come from the term of activation. So this kind of product can be obtained by activation process. 
And so that means they have to use high temperature. They have to put the chemical uh, as a mixture in the biomass sources. And then so they have to use multi-step processes, not only to burning like this, but they have to do the drying process first, and they have to put in the oven and they use high temperature and they have the washing step afterward. So it looked to be so a little bit complicated. They also have to use a lot of amounts of toxic chemical that they have to put in, right? Okay. And then so afterward, so starting from 100% by weight of the biomass sources, probably you get only maximum of around 20% by weight of activated carbon. So that means the left part with actually 80% with actually go out is, is uh, going out in the form of gases phase, like carbon dioxide when you do the, the activation process, okay? And when you produce this kind of product, especially when you, you want to use for the industry, so you have to use it in the form of five powders. So they're being really fine. So it's really small particles. So it's, it, it's really hard to remove from the system, right? So, so that means when you put in the dispersed in the water treatment unit and you stir for it for some time. And of course, I mean, you probably you have to wait for three days, four days or five days and let it sediment at the tank. And then so you, you can actually uh, get the, the clean water afterwards. So it wastes a lot of time. So if you talk about the industry scale, so they, they could not wait, right? Because so when they wait, so they have kind of um, uh, spend a lot of time. So they have to spend a lot of money as well to do this. So recently, uh, and this kind of things become quite more interesting yeah, not only me who actually uh, have done this kind of research, but also Fatima, you also uh, have done this kind of research. So it's called magnetic separation stuff or, separate, uh, or magnetic separable materials. Yeah, especially so I do the, the uh, assorption and Fatima, so you do the, the catalyst, I'm sure. So do you have published a lot of paper concerning this, right? Okay, let's talk my topic first. So next time when when I when 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 I have a chance, so I will invite it. Uh, I will invite Fatima to give a talk as well for your magnetic catalyst, right? Okay, <laughs> okay. Why we are quite interested in the in the magnetic absorption. So the magnetic absorption means so magnetic one can be used to be attracted by the external magnet. Uh, from this picture, which actually I get from the review from uh, these two, uh, these three professor who actually quite uh, big in the field of magnetic absorption. So they use the magnetic one. They introduce the term the magnetic property into their absorbent because they want to provide the rapid and efficient separation from the treated waste water by using an external magnet. Yeah, if you, if you talk about the external magnet, so you might see that, okay, when you use an external magnet, so that means you have to, 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 to build up the big magnet like that. But actually this is not really difficult at the moment because if you see from the, um, from the tray, uh, uh, treatment of the waste. So they also have to use the mag magnetic mag magnet, the big magnet to remove the kind of magnetic stuff before they, they, they will dispose that kind of, uh, con uh, this kind of trash into the other system, right? So they mean they want to recover it. So they mean they, they already have this kind of uh, uh, magnet stuff with actually being installed and is being used at the moment for the real system. So if we can just choose from the trash system into the water system, we can also do the same way, in the same way. So that means this is not the, good, not the new thing. And I, I, uh, I have spent my time 
for like already for five years at my university. But I really want to see the engineer to implement this into the real system and to use it. But so far, I have not seen any industry yet, uh, in the, any industry yet, to use this one for the water treatment. But it's still my uh, quite challenging for them to to make this kind of unit. Okay. Let's talk about how they can actually so far could get this kind of uh, magnetic adsorbent. So they use a lot of technique to do that, especially so they can actually obtain the adsorbent, the carbon-based adsorbent from uh, direct um, agricultural products, like from the almond chain, from the carrot draws, this is actually produced, if you talk about the almond, so you, you know, it's produced from the other countries, right? So they form, form the carrot. So what, what they do, so they do the carbonization first and they soak with uh, some uh, suitable chemical. Let's see, uh, let's talk about in this uh, presentation is mean. So they use a kind of uh, iron stuff to make the magnetization or that mean, so that mean they put the magnetic particles into the into the adsorbent matrix so this is the picture that this they, they show in the in their um, work that they can use just an external magnet so they already have the carbon adsorbent we actually have their uh, magnetic particles and trapped it inside the carbon matrix so when they just put uh, um, a magnetic ones next to it so it can actually um, attract the this kind of fire particle, right? But so far, for the magnetic carbon composite, and so far that I have searched from existing reports in the literature, so they still have the lot of disadvantages. Yeah. So they mean they use multi-step processes. They still spend use lot of high temperatures. So they have to consume a lot of uh, amount of harmful chemicals. So if you want to, to make it more sustainable in this more sustainable way. So what we have to care about is that, so we can actually use the simple short, shorter route for the production. So we can lower temperature a little bit. We can actually use in a way that we can make more environmental fed more environmentally friendly. So that means we use less toxic chemical to produce the magnetic carbon composite, okay? So that's why at the beginning, when I start my work at the Print of Songkai University, so around six years ago, so I start this kind of topic. So I started from the hydrothermal carbonization. You, are, you might be familiar with the term hydro, hydrothermal, because so the system is quite simple. So now we don't burn it anymore. We don't use the oven, um, the muffle furnace with high temperature or the temperature uh, beyond 500 degrees Celsius anymore. So we use this kind of things. So we call it autoclave, right? So this is a closed system. And, and the system, why we call hydrothermal? Because we put the uh, bio waste inside the bio waste actually contains a lot of cellulose, lignin, hemicellulose into the system. And of course, I mean, when we talk about the bio waste, when we talk about the cellulose, when we talk about the hemicellulose, when we talk about lignin. So that means you have a lot of oxygen functionality, right? So that means you have maybe 50% of carbon and you have another 50% of the, the, uh, the oxygen but you have a little left for uh, uh, other heteroatoms like sulfur or like uh, potassium or like a silica from your, uh, from your bio waste products. Okay, and you just put that kind of bio waste into the container, there's a so-called the autoclave and you put the water in. And so when you put in the temperature of around 180 up to 250, so if you see here, so it's quite low temperature compared to the others. So you have really my 
um, conditions compared to the normal activation process. So you use the, only the water as a medium, you use the mild condition, you can lower the temperature. So, and of course, I mean, you have to know emission of carbon dioxide, like in the case of pyrolysis or, or just a normal activation process because you have always a closed system, okay? And you can have the many availability of the various carbon precursor because you have a lot of kind of biomass that you can play with. And afterwards, so you can actually obtain a structure of carbon. And the HTC now seem to be the green and sustainable process. Okay, and now so or you can actually, I refer you to read this kind of paper, these two papers. So they are quite good about the review of the HTC process. Okay, let's come back to my work. So I start my work by using the sugar cane gas at the starting carbon materials. So why I choose the sugar cane gas? Not only because of my mom grow it a lot when I when I come back to my country and then actually uh, she have a lot like 50 acre to grow the, the sugar cane uh, because she she, pro she want to produce uh, the, the sugar out of that but actually so she, uh, she didn't produce by herself but she just sell the sugar cane to to the company okay so we have a lot of this kind of thing uh, this kind of uh 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 sugarcane in our country. So the, this kind of biomass is the main agricultural industry of Thailand. So we have around 28 million tons per year. So it seems to be abundant and actually they are quite low cost. So that means it's not costly, so you can use it. Okay, in terms of chemistry, because we are chemists, we have to talk about the chemistry that uh, our precursor are suitable for the application as a solvent or not or it is suitable to make as solvent or not. So that mean if we talk about the chemistry inside, so it's suitable because it contains an intrinsic porosity already, because we want to have the activated carbon or this kind of carbon stuff or hydrothermal carbon or hydrochar, we actually contain a lot of porosities. So it rich in cellulose, hemicellulose, lignin, which seem to be the good precursor for the carbon, right? Okay. Let's see the example that I published some years ago. Uh, how could we combine the carbon and the magnetics one together? So I'm really proud of this kind of uh, paper because so we published this paper in 2017 and now 2020. So it had been cited for more than 50 times. So that means so the people are still quite interested in this kind of uh, absorbent and not only the absorbent, so we use it for our environmental remedi remediation, especially I use this one for the treatment of the, some toxic chemical, and this is so called the tetracycline in this work. And the technique seemed to be quite easy, and this might be the reason that why the people read this paper quite a lot, because the, the method is really quite easy, right? Actually, so what we actually did in this work, so we call it the shortened route. So we just have the raw bagasse. We actually we wash the dust out of the uh, our um, precursor, and we, we just simply put it together with the iron two and iron three. Uh, this is also the key how to make the magnetic particle inside our carbon matrix. And we put also the base sodium hydroxide. And when we talk about the sodium hydroxide, you might say, oh, why you use sodium hydroxide in this case? You call it, so you, you, you call it the cleaner way, but why you still put the sodium hydroxide inside? Of course, we still use the sodium hydroxide, we still use the acetone, but we use in a lower amount. We just use sodium hydroxide, not for the activation, but we use the sodium hydroxide just to precipitate the magnetic particles in our system in this case, so that we have in this case, the iron two plus and three plus together because we want to make the magneti or magnetic particle inside the carbon matrix. So we have to use the sky of sodium dioxide to precipitate the iron two plus and three plus to mix together. And after heat treatment, so we will update later. 
the things that we can get that actually the magnetite particle which actually entrap in the carbon matrix. So consider this technique. You can see that we can use a temperature of only to 230 degrees Celsius for only one half, uh, for one day. And compared to the other tech, uh, other, uh, pyrolysis technique, so they have to use a lot of chemicals and they have the watching process. We actually have to watch out a lot of toxic chemical like sodium peroxide, potassium peroxide, or zinc, zinc chloride out of their system. And of course, they have a low, lower yield, but I, we have the higher yield. So we have around 40% compared to the raw bagasse material. So we do a lot of, we did actually the optimization a little bit with this kind of thing. We study a little bit when we uh, um, try to publish this kind of paper and the reviewer say, oh, optimization seem to be quite okay. So they let us to publish this kind of work. And so we test also the island leaching test and we found that, okay, so at the uh, very acidic condition, so this is not good to use. This is still limitation of the magnetic absorbent at the moment, because if we have a quite, talk, a quite acidic system, so that means it can leach out your magnetic particles. So that means you have, to, uh, you will lose your the iron species, because in this case, I use the iron, right? So, but if you use the nickel, or if you use the cobalt as a magnetic particle, you can also have the same problem when you use an, an uh, under acidic condition. But of course, I mean, still up to five pH of five, we can still use it. So we, we actually can have the, a little bit of iron leaching from the system, but it, that they are not so much anymore. Okay, I will explain to you later why we have a lot of uh, this uh, uh, leaching quite less compared to the other activated carbon. So we make the other technique to confirm that we have the good magnetization properties. So that means we use the um, VSM technique to determine that, okay, we have a, um, a, the diesel value of magnetization, okay? And let's see the, the nanostructure here. So from the SEM image, so you can see a lot of particles which actually on the top of our precursor because at the beginning, the sugarcane bagasse, it seemed to be quite smooth right when we actually use the SEM to 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 check this to see the morphology but after the the hydrothermal process so we can have a lot of uh, the particles actually uh, are trapped on the top of the surface of this sugarcane bagasse but this is not the iron particle this is the carbon particle which actually exact from the cellulose and then so it recombine themselves by using the condensation and make the particles out of that, if you can observe here. But where the iron particles are trapped in, they are actually again inside this kind of particles. Yeah, I will show you later from the TM image. And we check by the XRD and we see that, okay, by just using by simple method, we can get the structure of the magnetite so that means we can we can get the magnetite. So that means we we have the good magnetic property of this kind of material. So let's talk about here. If you make only carbon, you have no magnetic property. But if you put the things in like uh, the iron particle into it, so you can increase the magnetic property into that. So that means the main idea of using this one is that if you want to produce magnetic absorbent. You have to have the material which actually can have the magnetic property trapped into it. Yeah. Because the carbon itself is not has no magnetic property at all. Okay. Okay. Yeah, this is what I want to show. So from their other um, deep technique like TM, so you can see that we have actually the iron oxide, um, iron three. O4 oxide trapped inside the carbon matrix and we determine using the EDX and yeah, we can confirm that, okay, we have the iron oxide. And beyond that, we talk about the chemistry of this. So we still have a lot of oxygen. As I said at the beginning, why carbon material as an absorbent 
need the functionality because if we have a suitable functionality, so we can do interaction with our um, required contaminant, right? So in this case, so I confirm that. So I have, I have a, we still have a lot of, um, a lot of oxygen functionality abandoned in our system, which actually suitable for the adsorption because we can have the hydrogen bonding of the stuff that we try to use. This is the scheme, the overall scheme that we prepared it. Uh, so we start from iron to iron three, it seemed to be too, so cheap and interact with the hydroxide and heat it. And so we get the iron oxide later on and uh, iron three oxide, which actually entrapped in the, in the carbon matrix. So we use later to treat, to do the treatment. So we do, we did the tacycrine because this is our problem in our country as well. So be, because, so we have a, a kind of cattle and then so we, they use a lot of uh, this kind of medicine or this kind of antibiotics or uh, it's so-called tetacycrine a lot in our country. So it actually released in, into the real system, into the real environment and we have to remove it quite quickly. And I, we try to absorb this kind of antibiotic things and we try to, to use the adsorption technique. And so we do the bad adsorption technique and we do also the kinetics one. And then so we compare and then so we can propose that. Okay, so we have the iron particle which actually are entrapped inside the carbon particle. We actually can be obtained only by using the HTC method. And with the surface of a carbon, so we have a lot of oxygen functionality, including carboxylic acid, including the phenolic acid, including the ether, including the phen phen phenolic. And then so this kind of hydrogen bond can actually do interaction with the theta cyclin. So they mean because the theta cyclin have a lot of oxygen as well, which can actually interact quite well with the oxygen functionality from our SOPN. And the tetracycline itself, it contains a lot of aromatic rings, which actually can interact quite well with our aromatic from our SRBN by using the piper interaction. So we, we did the comparison a little bit with the thing that we actually can obtain from the paper. And we can see that the performance of removing the tetracycline in one system is not quite bad compared to the other works, but compare to the other work in terms of mouth per area. So we will see that, so we have actually higher value. Yeah. So that means you have the amount in terms of the area because we have quite small area for these cases. Uh, this is still the quite challenging that we have to produce more HTC technique which actually can result in the asorbin, the carbon asorbin, we actually already have the high surface area. Yeah, but still so far we can actually obtain only um, maximum about 50 square meter per gram. This is still quite quite challenging for our, our stuff like here. Okay, let's move to, to the next example of magnetic, magnetic particle, but we actually, so we can actually obtain from the other stuff as well. So, this kind of work, so I'm proud of that because so uh, the first work, so we use the sugar cane, right? In this work, so we use the water hyacinth, yeah, because the water hyacinth, we you you cause could not eat it, and they have no 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 causes at all. So okay, nowadays so they are quite uh, disgusting. So they block the canal. They they are the quite big problem of. Uh, to use the water and block the liver, block the canal, so the people could not use the water properly. And, but of course, I mean, so they try to make things out of this kind of uh, water hyacinth by using the handicraft product, making handicraft products, but still it's low value. Yeah. So I'm not sure uh, how much this lady have to spend a lot of time to make the things like it and sell to Germany. And, and so I think they have to produce like million of these handicraft products to, to buy only uh, one wheel of the Mercedes Benz, right? <laughs> okay. Okay. So in our technique, using the same way uh, for the 
um, hydrothermal carbonization. So we put, instead of sugarcane bagasse, we put a water hyacinth into the system. And we put, we do the same way. So we do kind of the, we do kind of an activation by using the hydrothermal. And the hydrothermal gives you two things, the solid product and the liquid product. Okay, and the solid product, so we do further with the activation with iron T plus and potassium hydroxide. If you see here, you can notice at all why you use potassium hydroxide again. So this is the max to put into the system. What we put in compare in the literature, we put in the very, very smaller amount in compare in comparison with the amount that they put in the literature. So that means we put a little amount of potassium hydroxide into system to precipitate the iron, and not only to precipitate the iron, but also to do the activation in the same way. Okay. For the liquid product, we do the activation as well, but we do with the potassium hydroxide with the, with the little amount. So that means in this system, so I'm proud of the term of a zero weight. So that means we, we have both the liquid and solid, but we use both of them to make the things. So we use the, uh, the liquid product to make the solid again, but we use it for the other application like in supercapacitor. But we taste already this kind of uh, uh, stuff that we use from the liquid product by, by uh, simple activation. And they can be also the good um, absorbent as well because it contains a lot of uh, porosity. But let's see this kind of stuff first. So we call it super absorbent. But why we call it super absorbent? Because it absorbs everything. All toxic product that we taste, methylene blue, methylene orange, and tetracycline. So it, it absorbs quite, quite good. And not only quite good, but also it's uh, quite fast. Uh, let me show you a little bit about the, um, how I shared the video. Maybe I share the video later. So only 20 minutes of removing this kind of stuff of after uh, shaking the stuff into this one. So you can actually have uh, the things which actually attract to the magnet, right? So it absorbs a lot because it contains large surface area and mesoporosity, which actually can host the big molecule like this. Okay, let's move to the other things. So I still use the bagasse, but I try a little bit to make the things like in the monolith form. So I don't use it in the in the in the case of um, uh, the fire powder anymore. Uh, but we, we try to make it in the term of uh, to use the ISA process uh, because I don't have a much time left. I, I will try to go a little bit faster now. <laughs> Sorry. So I coated the sugarcane bagasse using the our pyrocusino galoxylic acid, but seem to be uh, quite uh, fairly, environmentally fairly uh, chemicals for our product. Okay. And then so we coat it system into that. So we use the F127 as a template. We do carbonization, but um, if you notice here, we don't use the other uh, potassium hydroxide as an activation at all, all right? And then so we can get this kind of stuff. We can get the porosity just by burning this kind of two chemicals together on, onto the surface of the sugarcane bagasse. And later on, so this is uh, what we can obtain. So you can have the still the same shape, not the same shape, a little bit smaller size, but you can still have the kind of uh, um, the beads or, uh, or the kind of the monolith. So why we need the monolith? Because it, for the environmental system, so it's quite easy to operate. And this kind of monolith seem to be a spawn tube, spawn tie. We use some other technique, to actually determine the, uh, the surface area and also the porosity. And we can actually see the porosity as well in this case. Okay, we measure the pore size distribution and we measure the um, surface area and so on. And we try to absorb the, uh, the methylene blue and um, the other um, two dyes product as well. Okay, and let's see here, this is the best product that we obtain and the top one. Yeah. If you use only bagasse and you burn it 
and you have this kind of stuff, and you have also of this kind of uh, um, not floating anymore on the surf water surfaces after to, uh, 96 hours, so it means around three days, right? Okay, but let's see on the top. The top here, so you can actually can, you don't need to do anything. You just put on the top of the surface of the water. And then, so you, you let it like that. You, you might stir it a little bit, but after three days, it's still, they, they still float on the water surfaces. So that means it's quite easy to remove from the system. So just by using using your hand to pick it up, right? So compared to, to, to the, the other activity carbon that I do with the other way. So you, you can see that they, they don't absorb. But we related this property because it because of the porosity, yeah, because the methylene blue have the quite big size, um, uh, similar to the um, uh, uh, MO or methylene oren compared to the rhodamine B with actually um, two, uh, two times bigger than methylene, methylene blue and methylene orange. And then so you can see that, but still they can, they can actually absorb quite well. Uh, and we delayed this a little bit and we can see that the mesoporosity actually influence this kind of stuff. And then so we can actually so uh, continue our project for this kind of mesoporosity as well in our product. And of course, I mean, not only this one that can be, um, we talk about a magnetic soft band and how could you actually uh, get the magnetic ones into this one? So it's quite simple. During the, the coating process, you can add up the iron particles into that stuff already. So that means you can put the iron starting material like iron three plus into your system. So in the step of um, of um, of of this one. So after uh, this one, and then so you have to coat it with this uh, red uh, coating, right? During the red coating, so you can incorporate together the iron in this step. Right, so that means you can have uh, together the iron after ca uh, calcination, and then so you you have the the carbon which actually has a magnetic property as well. Okay, maybe I finish this slide uh, in in around two three minutes, and then so I will show you the the video a little bit. But I, I just have to leave on this slide first because otherwise I could not open the video. I I am proud to show you the video because it's quite attractive somehow. <laughs> okay. Okay, let's see here. So what, what actually um, we do later for our waste product. So we call it the black liquor. So we actually so have to thank the big company in our country who actually produced the paper. So the black liquor contain a lot of um, the lignin. Uh, so we use, we want to, use, to make it like a, a monolith form, as I said. So the monolith form is quite interesting in this case because so the monolith um, uh, can be used uh, quite uh, more convenient than the fire powder. So that means if we can have like uh, the monolith form and together with the magnetic particles, so that means it will be quite good, right? So, so we use the back liquor to make the hierarchical carbon magnetic porous material, okay? And we can actually obtain around 200 square meter per gram, which actually seem to be okay as well. And um, it can be conducted as well. And it, it is conductive. And so it have a good mechanical stability because if we want to use in the magnetic, uh, in the monolith shape, so we, we have to care about the, the, the mechanical property as well. So this is the kind of the product that we can actually obtain. So we use this kind of technique. So it's so-called the ice templating, or we can use the ice to mix, uh, sorry, to use the, only the water to mix with this kind of back liquor and do um, some kind of a freezing process and do the freeze pump tall by using the freeze dryer. And then so afterward we can get uh, quite nice nice material afterward but why we should to use the uh, that kind of um, actually so we mix thing together we mix sodium alginate together with the uh, 
uh, with the back liquor because the sodium alginate can make as a template, can play the role as a tem carbon template in this case, but we can actually don't burn only the sodium alginate because if you leave, if you only calcine the sodium alginate, so sodium alginate have really low thermal stability. So that means it have no advantages to use the sodium alginate to make the carbon. But the sodium alginate played a role as a template in this case, because it can integrate well the lignin into the sodium alginate. Okay, so we mix the thing together because it's also, it has the quite good compatibility between the back liquor and sodium alginate. And then, so we use the technique of free drying process, and we do it later with the pyrolysis. If you notice the 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 the, uh, the production team that I present to you here, you notice that we use no other chemical at all, right? So we don't put the sodium hydroxide in the system. We don't put the potassium hydroxide into the system as at all. And we can actually incorporate the iron into the system quite nicely by just just using. Um, uh, dissolve the iron particle into the alginate. Okay, this is how their uh, synthesis protocol look like. And then so we have the synthesis protocol like this. We have the freeze dry. And then so after we um, burn in the oven, and then so you have quite nicely uh, hierarchical porosity. So that means it contain both macropores and mesopore in between, and also a little bit uh, abundant of microporosity. And we use this one to absorb the lead ions because we have a lot of uh, microporosity which actually suitable for the, uh, the kind of um, a small molecule or small um, a pollutant like, uh, like ions. And then so we, did, we, we determine uh, by using the uh, XRD and we see that, okay, we can actually produce the iron a magnetic particle into our product. So our product represent with the, with the red line. And you still can see the sodium chloride and other sodium species we actually come from the back liquid already. But afterward, we can actually watch it out. So it's, it's, it's no problem in this case. So we actually use other technique to confirm that we really have the uh, silica, still have a little bit, but after watching, we still have this kind of carbon, oxygen, and of course, iron as well. So in, in, in the, our system, uh, and we actually um, uh, check that we can have the BT surface of around 200, which actually seem to be not so bad for this kind of material, this kind of monolith stuff. And of course, so this is the, the, the protocol that we actually can do. So mix, just mix things together and do the, um, uh, the freeze drying process, do calcination. And of course, I mean, afterwards, so we get quite nice structure of this kind of spawn. Uh, it's not really light, like uh, in kind of a carbon nanotube or graphene spawn, but comparing about the price, this is much cheaper. So it, I, I would say 100 times much cheaper than the carbon nanotube spawn. Okay, and we actually determine it and so we use it to absorb. And if you see, notice the picture here, so we also still have the magnetic property. So not only do you have like the ganura shape, but you also can attract it by using the, the magnet. So this is quite cool in, 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 in this case. So we check it for the performance of uh, interacting with the lead ion, which seem to be quite toxic chemical in our uh, environmental system as well. And then so we can see that, okay, because of our hierarchical structure, the contact time to absorb the maximum amount of ions uh, seem to be quite small. So that means it's quite fast absorption in this case compared to the other work, which actually seem to be more complicated and also use uh, other toxic chemical as well. Okay. So that means our work seems to be quite quite nice. And we also check the usability because we have kind of the monolith shape. So that means so we can simply operate it in comparison with the five powder one. Uh, so that means we can pick up by our hand and then so do it with the forcep and then so watch it and do the recycle. So of course for the conclusion. So we turn a little bit into the bio circular and green economy or the term BCG. 
Fatima, probably we have to submit together our proposal in this team, the BCG. And so I think they have a lot of funding agency want to give out us the money for uh, making uh, the uh, novel materials like what I present today. Okay, thanks a lot for the student who actually obtained a lot of award for the presentation or actually do the pitching with the company or something like that. And of course, I mean, would like to thank my student. Yeah, it seemed to be funny of us. Uh, and thanks a lot for all of you to, to um, uh, use a lot of power to, to make things happen in our lab. And thanks the funding agency uh, and um, also the some other company, my mom, my wife, of course, thanks Fatima as well, but Fatima is not my wife, uh, okay, <laughs> Fatima is my professor, okay, <laughs> okay, and thanks a lot of uh, uh, collaborator, and especially for our board, the first one, the number one for me, it's uh, UAI, of course, okay, thanks a lot, and uh, before I say telemakasi, so I just want to, to leave this slide a little bit, and just want to uh, show you the picture uh, that actually, so I have from the, uh, how I can show the video. I just want to share my screen. Yeah, uh, you can share your screen. Uh, I just share the screen and I have to click on, I'm not sure. Can you see something? Yes. Uh, you see the calendar, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you see the video now, right? Uh, we just see the calendar. Can you see the video now? No? No, no. Uh, okay, okay. Moment, please. Maybe I have to. So now you can see the video? Yes, we can, can see you? the video, but yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's time moving. So this is what I just said about the monolith stuff that we put a magnetic inside, and this is the magnet. Yeah, you can see that the, our monolith can be attracted just by using the magnet. And this seems to be quite light as well, right? Okay. Hope you enjoy it. <laughs> I have another um, video. Yeah, this is the methylene blue solution with very high concentration of about uh, 800 ppm. And seem to be quite a lot. And then so we use this kind of adsorbent with very high surface area of around 900 square meter per gram with magnetic property and shake only for one and a half uh, minutes. And later on, so after we attract using the magnet, we wait for 20 minutes. And of course, I mean, to attract, you can see. All right. Okay. Thanks a lot for your uh, particip okay. participation. Yeah. yeah. And thanks a lot for, for, for attending my talk. My boring talk a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. No. okay, okay, okay. Uh, thank you.
Terima kasih Dr. Nathan for the nice presentation. Uh, we have listened uh, the presentation from Dr. Lentong about adsorbent based carbon material especially in preparation activated carbon for uh, sugarcane batches uh, using hydrothermal method. Uh, and now we have uh, Q&A session, we have one uh, question from the participant. I will mm -hmm. share the question. Yeah, of course. And from Hakim UII, mm -hmm. how does the type and size of the raw materials affect the manufacturing of activated carbon? I mean, is there any significant difference with if we use leaf or some Test as raw material. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Please. Good question. Actually. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> actually, yes. We have to to care about this. Uh, if we talk about the size, I'm not sure if you talk about the size of the particle or if you talk about the size of the of the chemical inside. I'm not sure about this kind of question, but of course, I mean, I, I try to explain in a general term. So that means. When you start from to, uh, to put things in the uh, when you when you grind first uh, to make it finely like a, a sugarcane bagasse and uh, grind first and you use like a monolith shape uh, like a, when when you cut it like a, a big pieces and then so put a hydrothermal carbonization process so actually so they are a little bit different because so uh, the interaction of water to the precursor will be totally different because if you have a smaller particle, so it direct it, it direct quite well with the water, right? So you have more surfaces, more surface area to interact with the water. So that means you can actually obtain probably more functionality than the bigger particle that you put into the system. And of course, I mean, if you talk about the significant difference between if you use the leaf or the sawdust or the other raw material, especially for the sugarcane. So we try once with sugarcane bagasse and we try also with the sugarcane leaf. So they give us the different results. And of course, I mean, talking not only about the particle size or the size of the precursor that we add into the system, but we talk about the different in chemistry inside as well. So you have to take to care about how much cellulose, hemicellulose, or lignin, which actually are entrapped in the real, in your uh, starting precursor. So that means if you have uh, like a, a lot of lignin, for example, you will not get some kind of a carbon nanostructure, uh, but you will instead use kind of flat a carbon sheet afterwards. So it depends on um, different kind of precursor. But of course, so that's why I like this kind of work a lot. Because we, we don't try only the sugar canes. We don't try only the rice husks. You can also can try with different kind of stuff. Uh, because so because you have different kind of biodiversity, you have different kind of uh, uh, content uh, cellulose or hemicellulose or lignin content in your system. So that's why you can tune by just by using the different precursor. And you can also tune uh, by using your uh, condition for your production as well. Okay, is it clear? Yeah, I already answered the first question, I think, right? Okay, second question, can so that can remove all the phenol industrial waste water? Yeah, actually, yes. If you don't need to do anything at all, you can also use. But uh, the problem is that, so maybe you have to spend a lot of um, large amount of sawdust to do it. Uh, if, if they have the functionality which actually suitable for the fin to, to attract with the phenol, so I would say this is also the good idea. Yeah, so we call it the bio soft, bio soft bend. So that means you don't need to do anything with that. So you, you can use it like that. But of course, I mean, when you talk about the fancy uh, properties like magnetic property, you don't have that kind of property. So now I already answered the second question, right? I think. 
Okay, yeah, yeah. the third yes. question, what percentage of absorption, absorption capacity increase with absorption of negative particle? Yeah, it uh, depends on the, um, on the uh, on many parameters. When you add the negative properties, uh, when you add the negative particle into that, so that means your are, um, you are absorption will be heavier. So that means if you compare um, the absorption properties, the absorption efficiency, uh, you use the amount of the molecule divided by um, the weight of the absorption, right? So that means it will be decreased if you have the magnetic property inside. But as I show you from the from my um, from my uh, uh, video for the last video that I show you, you can see that the magnetic property also seem to be quite good, but the absorption property also seem to be quite good. It also depend on your system. So because in in my system that I show you in the last uh, video. Because it contains a smaller particle of iron particle, and also it's uh, um, they are not really um, they are not really blocking the pores, so that means they are not really blocking the adsorptive size. So that means so even they have the magnetic particle inside, but that they are not at all obstruction or, or obstruct the um, adsorptive size. I think this is clear, right? I hope. But this okay. you have to, to, to tune it by yourself. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Lantom. Yeah, no problem. Because of the limit of time, we move to uh, second speaker. Yeah. Uh, uh, but, thanks, yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you still stay in here, Zoom? I? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Of course. Do, do you still stay here? Yeah, yeah, of course, of course, until okay, okay. Uh, to well something, right? Yeah. Okay, I think if the response is one want to ask you again, I think yeah, it yeah, would, uh, can be answered in the last session. No problem. I will also okay. attend the, the next uh, the next presentation. Okay. Yeah. Thank Thanks you. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lam Tong, for yeah, nice um, presentation. And then we move to the second speaker. Uh, now we have. Dr. Rudy Shahputra. Before we start the presentation, I would like to show the profile of Dr. Rudy Shahputra. Uh, here, the short profile of Dr. Rudy Shahputra. Uh, he is a lecturer in Department of Chemistry, Universitas Islam Indonesia, and now uh, he is head of Integrated Laboratory of Universitas Islam Indonesia. He is reset topic is about uh, bioremediation of pollutant. And now he want to presentation about development on contaminated soil and water remediation process using electro-assisted phytoremediation and trapping zone and electrocoagulation process. And uh, we will invite Dr. Rudy Shahputra to uh, deliver a presentation. For the Dr. Rudy, uh, please. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you for the hosting of this meeting. Uh, it's very pleasure for me today to share my idea and my study uh, related to electro-assisted process. Uh, so. <coughs> Today, I will share to my study. <clears throat> so the title of this uh, today presentation about the challenges of the electro assisted on the enhancement of environmental remediation as the green processes. And I will come to my partner from uh, Thailand to join up this presentation. Uh, it could be maybe for the further, we can make some relationship for research items. And I can invite uh, some of your students with my lab join to my labs. Then we can construct some new study 
and very interesting video study related to magnetic uh, materials. Okay, uh, <clears throat> uh, this is my profile, as already mentioned by the hosting. Uh, <clears throat> and then actually, uh, my interest fields research in environmental remediation, environmental chemistry, chemical instrumental analysis. And also I'm studying about the new and renewable energies. So now my current position as the heat of integrated laboratory. This is the prestigious institute in our university. So now I keep uh, many uh, luxury and fallible instrumentation in my laboratory to support research in, in this university. So before I continue my presentation, I would like to share uh, some video related to my laboratory. So it means that uh, my partner from the Thailand, they can do some research here using our instrumentation. And also I hope so, uh, we can so do you use of your instrumentation in your laboratory, I think so. So, Saat ini, laboratorium UII telah kembali memperoleh status akreditasi ISO 17025 berturut untuk yang ketiga kalinya pada tahun 2024 dengan meningkatkan kemampuan UII sebagai universitas terbaik swasta di Indonesia dan mewujudkan imaji UII 2050 sebagai riset universiti dalam era industrial revolution 4.0 maka laboratorium terpadu telah meningkatkan fasilitas implementasi analisis kimia dengan perlatan otonomis dan bahasa teknologi. Laboratorium Instrumentasi merupakan laboratorium yang disediakan sebagai komitmen kami untuk menyediakan para peneliti internal universitas Indonesia maupun para peneliti seluruh layanan komitmen ini dan akan kami proses untuk pengujian dan dalam komitmen tersebut kami Kemudian kami memiliki yang memiliki untuk 
sebagai pengujian material dari kami memiliki dengan PSA yang memiliki kemampuan untuk memberikan kesempatan perusahaan atau kosmopoli CTH Laboratorium Pendidikan Terpadu UI menggunakan basis teknologi pendidikan praktikum yang mengedepankan teknologi bertanya dengan ditunjang mengajar yang mempunyai kompetensi So that's all uh, our facility. So we invite all the researchers from whole of the Indonesians. Uh, they can send a sample to our laboratory and we guarantee for the results, uh, good results for the analysis. Oh, sorry. Sorry, 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 sorry. Okay, sorry. I will continue for my shape for my study today. So <clears throat> before talk about my study, uh, this is the facts and figure of our university. It was uh, established in 8 July 1945, means that 40 days before the independent days of the Indonesia by the nation of the fathers. And this is the first university established by the Indonesian peoples. Today, we have the eight faculties, uh, Islamic studies, economics, law, civil and planning, engineering, industrial engineering, science, uh, medicine, psychology, and social science with uh, 28 studies program. And within all of them, 11 program had been accredited by international board. Now, today, the university have 25,000 student body, uh, a accredited by National Accreditation Board and leading private university in Indonesia. And these are some scenes in our university. This is the landmark of our university, is the Masjid Ulil Albab, a central library, consists of two million books print and a library. This is the main gate and the, uh, the campus, the main campus view. And here's some figure about the department of the chemistry. This department established in 1997. Uh, that, that time we opened the undergraduate chemistry program. Uh, today our number staff is 23 members. Uh, including three professor, four associate professor, and 16 assistant uh, professor. And this year we got uh, excellent aggregated by National Aggregation Board. And uh, almost two years ago, we got the Royal Society of the Chemistry as the international aggregations from the UK. And we have the Essential of Research Center and just uh, last year, we already established the master program in the chemistry. Now we have uh, 30, around 30 students. And the chemistry, the, the Department of Chemistry is leading in index publications uh, within the university. 50% of publication paper in our universities indexes by Scopus. And then this is a situation in our daily classes number of students around the 400 
from the western to eastern regions and the female to male ratio seven to one so a lot of the uh, female students than male students and uh, our student is a leading in national international science competitions uh, last year uh, we got the winner in the asian uh, competition at the university of malaya So now my presentation. So <clears throat> I show you the established technology for soil remediations. So we have achieved today uh, something different when we remediate uh, liquid and uh, uh, and the solid soil, for example. Uh, the speaker from Thailand uh, he talked about how to remediate uh, the liquid ones, but this is uh, very different when we uh, remediate the soil. This is a hard one uh, because uh, the complicated system uh, between the pollutant and the soils. And the soil itself as the absorbance. And the soils contain so much uh, clay minerals. That means the clay minerals can tightly bond with uh, uh, pollutants such as uh, the heavy metals. Some of the technology had been used today around of us, for example, the isolation, removals, and stabilization system. Uh, means uh, we can isolate the pollutant, the heavy metals, or remove the heavy metal, or stabilize the heavy metals, for example. And then here, uh, some of the technology we can use today, for example, the isolations, like a solidification, solidification, stabilization, vitrifications, and stabilization, like the chemical stabilization and phyto stabilization, means that using the uh, the plants, the phytoremediations, and the removals mean we take it the pollutants from the soil, not just only to isolate or to stabilize. We can use the electrokinetic remediation, soil flushing, and phyto extractions. So today I will talk about the electrokinetic remediation and some combined with the phyto uh, remediation process, for example, the phyto extractions. And this is the estimated operating cost of the remediation technologies. Uh, so here in the, we can see some the the established technology already present today. Like the containment, solidification, filtrification, soil washing, soil flushing, uh, pyrolurgical, and electrokinetics. So here, the electrokinetics is a quite uh, cheaper than the other ones. And then this is how we can uh, evaluate some of the alternative remediations. Uh, first, by aims of the remediations and second by the remediation options. For example, uh, the characterizations mean to demonstrate compliance with established criteria or complete removal uh, by down the sum readily acceptable at the point, for example. And then by the remediation options, remediation by characterizations, you can demonstration of no problem or exclusions, avoidance of the problem, containments, means covering or fixation in situ, treatment, concentration or extractions, and then uh, removals, bull removal of contamination and medium. So uh, the electrokinetic remediation is a kind of the removals. Then we choose the options by combining the aims and the remediation option, and then we decide. And then this is the criteria that we should uh, away when we applied some uh, remediation technology, they satisfy endpoint criteria, optimize the dose reduction, avoid the spreading of the contamination from the site, avoid unnecessary risk either now and the future. So that's why we think that the electrokinetic remediation is the low risk uh, technology process, and also this is a kind of the green technology process, I think. So this is the environmental remediation challenge. Uh, this is our study in our laboratory. So 
like I said before, uh, we try to command the electrokinetics and the phytoremediation. Then we got a new ERPR developments. Also, uh, we have a chance uh, combined with the PRB materials, uh, permeable reactive uh, barrier materials. I will, I will uh, uh, show you about of these materials uh, combined with already established of the electrokinetic process for both the contaminated soil and the water. So it means that we can apply all this technology either in soil or in water. So before that, I would like to explain you some the principle of the electrokinetics. This is a simple process. Uh, this is a soils. The yellow one is the soils. So it means that the process is in situ. We do not taking the soils. We just uh, do the process uh, uh, on site. So here we put one electrode as the positive and the other electrode is the negative. And then uh, we purge with some electrolyte solutions around of the electrodes. And then at the same time, the water will be electrolyzes and in the anode side, they will produce the hydrogen ions. I mean, uh, around of this anode electrodes is the acidic zones at the pH to around two to three. And then the, in the ketodes area, uh, the water will be uh, reductions, uh, produce the hydroxides here. So I mean the pH is around 11 to 12. And then the pollutants in the soil will move depending on the charge. For example, the positive one move to the ketodes and the negative one move to the anode. And what about the natural pollutants? The natural plant we remove by electro or osmotic uh, flow. Uh, kind of the phenomena will arise during the electrokinetic process. So one of the problems when we applied of these uh, technologies in the soils, uh, there is uh, what we said the pH junctions. Here, the location of the pit junctions uh, actually near the cathode uh, area. When the pollutant uh, precipitates uh, in this area, so this is a challenge how to handle of the problem during the electrokinetic process. And then this the uh, the influence of the electric fields for the electrokinetic transport. Uh, some of the Properties, for example, the electromigration source by these equations. So U here is equal to the E. E means electric fields. So it mean the velocity, the mobility of the ion is depending on the ionic mobility. And then also for the electrosmosis, like I uh, uh, let I saw before, uh, that. Uh, uh, the velocity is depending on the, uh, the electricity, the electric field. So I mean the electromigrations is affected by electric field ionic mobility. And then the distance between the electrodes uh, uh, controlled by the uh, electric field. For example, when we applied 50 volts per centi, so the mobility is quite low. But when we increase the voltage like a 500, the mobility is quite increased. Other things that are very important when we apply in the soils about the permeability, because uh, kind of the soil is, is uh, depending on the permeability uh, factor. For example, here, the hydro permeability for the gravel is a quite uh, low, uh, quite high compared to the clay, uh, because uh, for the grapples, uh, they can move like uh, uh, 10 minus two square per meter seconds. But for the clay is uh, less than 10 minus eight meter square uh, per second. So there's no problem for the coarse sands and the fine sands, for example. So mean that when we applied of these technologies in the, in the grapples, they can move from 10 to a hundred meters per day. So they're very, very moving, very fast moving compared to the clay. 
So that's why uh, this technology mostly applied in the clay uh, soil materials. So this is our study. At uh, that time, we tried to use the drinking, aluminum drinking water treatments as the attramping zones. Uh, here, we evaluate two kinds of the uh, drinking water treatments is the Miyachi and Nishino, a kind of the water purification stations uh, in Hokkaido uh, area. So these are the principles. Uh, this is, uh, for example, the, uh, the source of the pollutants. They're moving in the groundwater uh, by the gravitation, I think. And then when we put some permeable reactive barrier here, and when they move, through the materials, and then the pollutant will be entrapped, uh, entrapped in the materials. And then we got the treated water here. That's the principle. But the ability of the material is the main process, and the electrokinetics uh, is the support process uh, in the system. Uh, because, uh, like I explained before, that uh, pollutant will move in from the anode to the cathode. So for example, when we put uh, in the sides is the anode and the other side is the cathode. So the pollutant uh, will be moved uh, through the materials. And then uh, at the same time, the water will be treated uh, to be the clear water. So why we use the aluminum uh, water treatments uh, sludge here? Uh, because uh, these materials is able to absorb uh, the heavy metals from the aqueous. And then for the, some sustainable issues, uh, is this the waste recycling and reutilization, energy efficient process, environmental friendly, cost reductive uh, advantage, for example. Uh, here, uh, we see that uh, a lot of the sludge produce. Uh, this is the current situation in the Japan. Also here, uh, they just uh, put it the sludge as a landfills, nothing to use. So that's why when we explore uh, of this uh, materials, then we can solve some problems in the our environment. So <clears throat> for example, this is the cloudy water. Then when we put some uh, aluminum water treatments here, for example, PIC. Uh, this is a common uh, chemical we use to clean the water. And then uh, they make flock and uh, during the flocculation and coagulations. And this is the aluminum water treatments. And then when we dry uh, of this material, then we got off this kind of the material. For example, this is the Miyamachi sludge and this is the Nishino sludge. The difference is Nishino sludge, a content of the carbons. Uh, when I visit of the stations, uh, the office, the officer said uh, because uh, they want to remove the, some odor from the water. So that's why they added uh, some uh, activated carbon uh, after uh, the water uh, use, uh, had been flocculation and coagulation. And this is a purpose uh, in our study. So this is the normal electrokinetic remediation process. So this anode, the cathodes, yeah, and then the ions are moved uh, from anode, the cathodes. So when we put some uh, material here as a PRP, so we can produce the treated grain water here. And we tried to prove of this a kind of the study by put some clean soil here. For example, this is the experimental setup, 1D reactor, one dimension reactor here. So we divided the compartment in the, our reactors uh, into five sections. And then we put the contaminated soil in one, two, three sections. And then for the fourth section, we put the entropy zone. 
uh, here in our study, we put uh, uh, drinking water sludge. And then for the fifth section, we put the clean soils to prove that uh, this uh, material can absorb the contaminants. Here, in this case, we using the lead uh, as the contaminant, this heavy metal contaminants. And this is what looks like of the reactor during the process. So uh, here in our experiment, we using the power supply, a DC power supplies, uh, depending how long of this reactor. For example, in this uh, picture, the reactor is about 15 centimeter. So because uh, we using one fall per centi, so uh, the potential applied is about uh, 15 falls. So I mean, we get one fall per centi. So this is situation before, without the electric zones. So like I said before, the section one to three is the initial concentration soil. And then clean soil in the section four and five. So with the entropy zones in the section four, we put the entropy zone. In this case, we use the uh, water sludge, the sludge. And this is the results. So for the experiment uh, without the entropy zones, the lead distribute uh, into the uh, all the sections from one to five, from anode to the cathodes, uh, including the clean soils. But what about when we applied the entropy zones? So mostly the lead uh, depos deposited in the section four means that the section which contain the electric zone uh, materials. Then we got that in the clean soil, even though we mark a little bit a loss of the aluminum uh, in the clean soils, but uh, it's very low concentrations. Then we observe how the aluminum can uh, also uh, deposit it in the clean soils. But when we measure that, the clean soils uh, only contain 0 0.02 milligram uh, per gram. And then uh, we see that uh, close to the anodes, close to the anodes, uh, mostly the aluminum is very low. And then, but depending on the kind of the sludge, like I said before, the Nishino is content the carbons and the Miyachi without content the carbons. I mean, the, if the sludge fully contains the aluminum sludge, they can uh, absorb most of the uh, heavy metal compared to the uh, Nishino, which it contains of the carbon uh, materials. And then the other study, uh, uh, the cesium contaminated soil after the accident in Fukushima nuclear reactor. I did this uh, study during my postdoc in the Hokkaido University, collaboration with the Professor Tanaka. This is the situation at the times, uh, March 11th, uh, 2000, 2011, 2010, yeah? That the 8.9 uh, magnitude, yeah? A uh, great East Pacific equat. The situation in the uh, in the Fukushima area at the times, and then not the only of the uh, the tsunami, but only struck of the nuclear reactor at that at that area, and then spread the radionuclide uh, around of the Japan's and some of the other areas. This is the, the situations in the 12th April. Uh, uh, one month after the accidents, uh, we see here uh, about the 300, uh, 370,000 terabyte wells uh, already spread off the world. And then <clears throat> one of the crucial issue in the electrokinetic remedies is the electric configurations. So we study the electric configurations when we applied, this is the situation the possibility applied in the in situ condition. I mean, in the real situations. Uh, but we use uh, the 
the, the design like this of the reactors. Uh, here, uh, we use the rectangular com configuration means that we just can put 20 electrodes or the hexagonals, we can expand until 36 electrodes and other maybe a triangular only the 18 uh, electrodes. And this is the results. Uh, for the rectangular configurations, uh, it is proved that uh, all the cesium uh, deposited in the upper sides, and the upper sides of the of the uh, ketodes, they're moving from the back side. Back side means uh, uh, from the deep ones, deep layer here. This is the first layer, second layer, and third layer. The third layer is the top, uh, close to the tops, close to the ketode uh, electrode. And similarly for the hexagonal configuration. So it means uh, when we configure the electrode in the rectangular, for example, it is proof that can remove the cesium from the soils. And then the situations, uh, the F, the F0.3 and F0.1, this is the real soils uh, taken from the locations uh, near the Fukushima area. And the kaolin is the model of the soil, uh, also the smectite, model of the mineral soils. And we see that the kaolinate is a quite strong bond with the cesium uh, compared to real soils. So then we continue our study at the similar configurations. So here, the cathodes in the above of the soils. And then uh, these uh, uh, cells are fully uh, loaded with the cesium contaminated soils. Then we run the experiments. Then we got this. We see that uh, the entropic zone is here in the upper in the upper side, we still use the Miyamachi or Nishino. And then uh, all the soils is uh, fully with the contaminated uh, soil. So they all move yeah, from the lower, middle and the upper, the upper close to the entropic zones. Here, the production, uh, the retained cesium is very small here in Miyamachi. But for the Nishino, since the con the Sino also contains the uh, uh, activated carbons, uh, uh, mostly of the cesium concentration deposited in the entropic zones. Uh, in this case, uh, for the Nishino. So in such a configuration, it is already proved that when we using the 2D reactor system with combined entropic zone here, in this case, using the Miyamachi and Nishino, they can uh, absorb the cesium uh, maximally uh, in the entropic zones. And then uh, <clears throat> since the study in the soil is very hot and quite long like experiment, then we change the experiment using the water. We call this as the electro-assisted fermentation. The first publication of these, uh, this water already appears in this uh, paper. So we combine the electrokinetic remediation with the phytoremediation. We already know the phytoremediation is the use of the plant system to clean or restore contaminated soil, sediment, and the waters. Here, for example, uh, the plant is, uh, consists of roots part and the uh, short part. And in root parts, uh, they can play as the phyto stabilization or phyto stimulations. They keep the pollutants in the root part. If the pollutant can move to the other part of the plant, means that in upper part of the plant, in short, for example, there can be the other mechanism like the phyto extraction, phyto stabilization, phyto, phyto degradation, for example. So uh, it is prefer if the plant can move uh, the pollutant from the soil 
to the short parts because uh, easy to remove the short part and then the plant already uh, will grow again uh, like like uh, like the first process when we plant the plants uh, in the soil for example but mostly uh, as the biological system in the plants the pollutant will be uh, deposited uh, in the shots as the resistance of the soil uh, of the plants or for the toxicity So the advantage of the fatty remediation is the cost effective when compared to other more conventional methods. Nature, more aesthetically pleasing. For example, in some locations, they make like a gardens, but actually the garden is the, for the fatty remediation process. And the minimal land disturbance and multiple contaminants can be removed with the same plants. So we just uh, select you know, which plant that can proper to plant in the soils when uh, the soil had been contaminated by heavy metal, for example. However, some limitation of the fetomination, for example, uh, the plant root is not so long. So the pollution plant cannot be so deep in soil or groundwater. There's some, some problems. Slow and difficult, so mean takes long time process and decrease in action during winter months when plants are dormant, for example. So mean, uh, for the subtropic area, they have a face uh, winter. Uh, here we in tropical area, we, we doesn't face, face that, uh, the winter, right? So we just have rainy season and dry seasons. So the big problem is uh, because the root is cannot uh, reach the deep uh, contamination plan. So that's why we need to uh, support of fiduciation process by using the electro assisted. It's a kind of the electrode configuration that we can apply com uh, combined with the fatty remediation. This is 1D process, for example, and that to the ketone, so they can moving and during the moving, so the root absorbs the pollutant, for example. But when the anode is quite longer than the cathodes, maybe they can pass with a little bit deep contamination plan. But what about the 2D configurations? Either we put uh, in both sides with the anode and the surface with the cathodes, or maybe we change the position, the cathodes in the upper position and the anode in deep, uh, in deep uh, soils. But I think in the D figure is not so preferred compared to the C because uh, easy one with the C, we just uh, put it the anode uh, not to dig up the, uh, the soil and put the anode uh, beneath the soils. So uh, <clears throat> since the experiment in the soil is a take for a long time, then I changed the study using the, the aquatic media. So before to evaluate a study in the aquatic media, we try to evaluate uh, either the electrode configurations can be, re uh, can be used to remove the heavy metal concentration or not from deep uh, waters uh, experiment or in soil experiment, for example, using the agar experiments. So here we divided the agar uh, with uh, four uh, compartments. The contaminated agar in the bottoms and then the clean agar in the third, second and first layer. So here, the black one is the contaminated agar, mean the, in the bottoms. Then after uh, three days experiments, so most of the heavy metal move to the upper surface, uh, the upper surface, and they concentrate in sub sax area uh, in the middle of the uh, electrode configuration. Then we construct of our electrode configurations uh, according of the agar experiment, and we got a similar results also here. So this is the experiment in the soils. So we put the contaminated soils in the bottoms and the third, second, first layer is the clean soils. 
after the experiments is the white one is the uh, the white one so the contaminated soils so the experiment start with 100 uh, initial concentrations but after uh, 15 days it's a quite long experiment uh, half months so the contaminant the pollutants are reduced and move uh, to the surface even though they cannot reduce uh, much uh, they cannot reduce uh, height concentration of the heavy metals but uh, the picture uh, has the evidence that uh, the electrode configurations uh, can remove the pollutant from the soils so the experiment in the soil is take very long time this is the condition in 15 days so i think when we maybe take longer for example one month the picture may be quite different and that time we use a such kind of the plant here is the grass kentucky bluegrass kentucky bluegrass and then this is evidence how the grass also can absorb the pollutions uh, mostly they uh, deposit in uh, deposited uh, in the root area compared to the short area. Uh, this is the calculation with the uh, sun's location factor and this uh, bio accumulation bio accumulation capacity here. So that uh, mostly the grass uh, deposited uh, uh, the pollutants in the soot part, in the soot part, uh, in the root part. And then we continue with the aquatic experiment uh, because in the aquatic experiment we just need a short time. Uh, here we explore using the uh, aquatic uh, uh, aquatic uh, float uh, float float plant like the kayu apu in Indonesia, Pistia stratiotes, or a chengandok. Echinacrasipes with the special design of the uh, electrode uh, electrode port cathode here. Uh, this is the evidence that uh, the pollutant here, the heavy metal, they they move from the side of the anode. This is the anode. Uh, we use the titaniums as the anode, and then in the upper side we use the stainless steel as the cathode. And then this is examples uh, from the seven days experiments. Uh, the lead and the copper uh, going down, decrease the concentration. And then for the lead, uh, only one day, and then they remove all. Compared to the copper, a little bit uh, take longer times uh, because the copper more toxic than lead uh, for the plants, I think so. So this is the kind of the floating aquatic plant that have been used for our experiments like the semangi air, eceng gondok, kiambang, and kayu apu. And this is the, uh, the evidence, also the pistia stratiotes, I mean uh, kayu apu, they can use to remove the lead and couple. And then this eceng gondok or ekorna crassipes, also they can remove uh, lead and copper, but mostly lead and copper deposited uh, in the uh, in the root part. A similar results with the other uh, plants. And then for the recent development, uh, we combine the electroaccumulation with the ERPR, the ERPR with aerations, and now still ongoing study the electrocoalition and aerations. So here, the electrocalculations uh, is the electrochemical method of treating polluted water, whereby sacrificial anode corrode to release active coagulant. So I saw you before that the coagulant is the PSC, polyaluminum chloride, a similar picture here. We put in the colloidal water and then we stir and we got uh, of uh, these uh, sediments. So now, we change the chemicals using the aluminum or the ferro uh, metals here. And 
we applied some DC voltage to the cells and the aluminum will corrode and then they produce the uh, they, they produce the precursor, the coagulant precursors. This, here the reactions in the anode, the oxidation of the aluminum, they produce the aluminum ions and the cathode, the water will be hydrolysis and produce the hydroxide. And then uh, this is the hydrolysis of the aluminum with hydroxide <coughs> to produce the precursor for the coagulant. <coughs> and here we combine with the aerations uh, because the aeration we can control the size of the bubbles, uh, the water bubbles uh, by injection the oxygen in the water. So we think that uh, when we put more oxygen in the water, so the, <clears throat> the plant will be survived longer uh, because in fact we see that when we just applied the electro-assisted phytoremediations, the plant uh, died early so that we cannot use this for the longer experiments, for example. And first, our project is uh, using the combination of the electrocalculation and the ERPR reactors. So we see that, uh, we saw that the uh, electrocalculations uh, is used to decrease the organic. And the ERPR system, I mean electro-assisted phytoremediation, is used to decrease the heavy metals. So uh, this ERPR itself cannot remove all the contaminant from the wastewater. So that's why we divided of the system into two systems, one of the electrocalculations and continue with the ERPR system. So Others, uh, other than the flow, flow plans, we can use also the hydroponic system. Here uh, we, ha we have already used the bamboo air or equisitum haimele and rumput akarawi, akarwangi or fetifera, fetifera and also uh, pak choy. Uh, this is our projects, uh, combination of the electrocalculations and uh, ERPR. Uh, for the uh, remediate the batik wastewater with the good results. And the result is that uh, treated with batik wastewater is, uh, uh, can be used as the, as the water quality standard of class four, uh, according to the government's, uh, uh, government standard. That means the water, the batik treated water can be used as the irrigation and any other use of its similar requirement. So the batik is the textile, the indigenous textile of Indonesia. So kind of the wastewater from the batik industry is uh, looks like a kind of the textile industry. And other experiments uh, we applied in the chemical laboratory wastewater treatment here. Similar, we using the electro calculation and the APRs. But here in this experiment, we using the water hyacin before we use the bamboo ayat. And also the results, they can uh, uh, treat the chemical lab wastewater uh, according to the water quality standard of class four uh, according of our governments. And then uh, since the ERPR systems, they make uh, uh, the plants on the early diet. So we need to increase the capacity of the ERPR for the longer times, for example. Then we combine with the aerations. So the aim to increase the survival of aquatic plant on the heavy metal contaminated water and the micro bubble produced from aeration has maintained the plant growth during the ERPR. Uh, this is the evidence. Uh, we use the model of the lead and copper polluted water, and we use the fatty percolate grass here as the plants. And then we combine the aeration with the uh, uh, ERPR system. Then we got this, uh, mostly of the heavy metals, they uh, deposit it in the root area. And then this is example for the copper. 
actually the couple sometimes only three days the plant can stand, but now they can increase more time until uh, six day. Uh, after that, the uh, the seven day they die. So uh, this is the phytomorphic changes when we observe to the plant during the experiments. And in the other experiments, we use the uh, pak choy. Yeah? Uh, pak choy usually used as uh, uh, vegetables in our tables. Uh, my students, they try to use this and to evaluate the condition of the pak choy for the leak uh, polluted water. Uh, here, the experiment can show you that uh, for the ARPR aeration, they can longer, they can longer life. Uh, compared to the EAPR itself or factor remediation or phyto aeration. And then also for the last session of this experiment, we observed the chlorophylls and the chlorophyll profile so that the plant can stay uh, in good conditions uh, until the last of time in the experiments. And the table shows you how the concentrations are in the in, in the plants here mostly concentrations of the uh, heavy metals are deposited in the in the root but for the ARP aeration they can also move to the short part and a lot of the heavy metals they concentrate in the short either also in root uh, compare with the ERPR itself of phytoaeration or phytoremediations. And this is an ongoing study. We also combine the electrocolation and aerations. Uh, here for the aerations, we try to increase the enhancement of electrocolation on the removal organic components in the wastewater. So the marker bubbles produce uh, uh, from the aeration, increase the uplifting the flock and hinder the sedimentations uh, in the bottom of the reactors. Uh, this study is uh, still going on, so we now try to observe. So the conclusion, we can say that therefore the polluting a process of environmental remediation using electro-assisted method. A briefly conclusion are as follow. First, the electrokinetic remediation and electro-assisted phytoremediation process is a Promising feature technology that can be applied in the environmental remediation for contaminated soil and aquatic environment. And then electro-assisted can be combined with other technology for safer and more efficient process in the remediation uh, process. And now this is the early study. I uh, just got some uh, supporting financial funding from the Bristak Dikti. Uh, the chemistry of uh, research and technology of Indonesian governments uh, to study of the electroflotation system in the treatment of the pit waters. This is the early results what we have got uh, during of this year. Uh, <clears throat> here for the electroflotation, we see that when the water had been electrolysis, in the anode they can produce the oxygens, and the cathode they can produce the hydrogen. What is the difference with the electrocoagulations? Here in electroflotation, we use the anode. Uh, we use the anode material is the electrode made from non-corrosions metals, for example, titanium, platinum. Uh, this is quite different with electrocoagulation because in electrocoagulation we use the aluminium or ferrous, and the cathodes we can use whatever kind of the metals, for example, stainless steel for the cheap one, for examples. Then for the first of our study, we try to optimize our reactors. Then we got the 20 volts is the maximum conditions to do of the electrofluorotation to produce the high bubbles uh, uh, productions. And then uh, we applied the electrofluorotation process in the pit water. This is the situation before and this is the after, very clear water. And then we confirm of the clear water using the like intensity. Uh, here for the pit water, uh, the light cannot the light cannot pass through the, the solution, the liquid. So that's why the intensity is very slow, very low, 
152 looks. And then compared to the electric rotation, much more, uh, mostly uh, four times, okay? four times the light can through. And then this is a compare with the biocoagulation process. Uh, and then uh, we compare also if the combined would be a uh, coagulant and electrofiltrations with the results uh, a little bit lower compare electrofiltration itself, for example. So this is a promising study. We still ongoing study uh, because uh, in some area of the Indonesia, for example, in the Sumatra area, in the middle Sumatra, like in Riau, Jambi, and Bengkulu, uh, the water is from the pit water, is the, the black water, or the brown water. And mostly in the area in the Kalimantan, in the Borneo Island also, uh, they had uh, only for the black water or the brown water for their daily consumption. So I would like to acknowledge to those home students, this is our and our undergraduate student who work hard in my laboratory to support of the study. And also they have challenge. Uh, and then every year I send my students to the national science competitions. And this year we got uh, some, uh, some award from these competitions. I would like to acknowledge with some partners who support my study. And thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Rudy. Uh, uh, Dr. Rudy has explained to us about uh, many things about remediation, uh, especially we note that uh, Dr. Rudy has uh, conducted a bioremediation combining with EAPR. And now we have a Q&A session for Dr. Rudy. Uh, now we have three question that I will share the question in the screen. Okay, this is the two question. The first question from Dr. Lime Thong and Rafi Ikhtiari. And the third is from Uwin Sofiani. For the first question, uh, Dr. Lime Thong uh, asks about the system you have used. Can it be used to remove ion selectively for example, if we have a mixture of PP ions and calcium ions, we want to remove only PP ions. Is it possible? And the second, in the same your developed unit can remove ions. What about the toxic molecule? Is it possible using electrokinetics? Please, Dr. Rudy can answer the questions. So thank you, Dr. Lam Dong. Uh... <clears throat> So for the ion competition, for example, the lead and calcium, for example. So it is depending on the plants, for example, uh, when we talk about the ERPRs. But what about when we talk about the electrokinetic remediations? So most of the papers, uh, uh, some paper, they study about the combinations of the heavy metals. Uh, actually, the, for example, the calcium. The calcium, I think uh, this ion will be precipitated uh, because the calcium is easy to precipitate by hydroxide, for example. That's why that uh, soils that contains much more the carbonate, for example, uh, it is hard to remove the heavy metals from the soils. So for the autokinetic uh, process, for example, in the soils, they focus to remove the heavy metals. And if they find something in the soils that can hinder the process, for example, the uh, anionic uh, precipitation, for example, the calcium, for example, it is not easy to remove the heavy metals because we could uh, face the precipitation from the calcium hydroxide or calcium carbonate, for example. And what about uh, the toxic molecules? Uh, I'm not focused to remove the toxic molecules, for example, the polyaromatic hydrocarbon, for example, or for the diesel oil, for example, with the organic contaminated soils. But uh, many papers uh, also shows that if the, we combine the electrokinetic process with the bioremediation, mean we use some like uh, microorganisms and the microorganisms that produce the surfactants in the soils, 
and then surfactants can be can be moved uh, depending on the charge, positive or negative in the soils. So it is quite possible when we uh, applied some surfactant in the soils uh, combined with the electrokinetic process. It's okay. Okay. Uh, any feedback from Dr. Lemson? Okay. Enough. Yes. Uh, and the, yes. Thanks, Dr. Rudy. Okay. Uh, and the second question. Uh, would you like to share with us the potential application of EQR and ERPR in a real environmental condition, especially in Indonesia? And is there any obstacles while applying the method? And the second, after phytoremediation process, in order to avoid the toxic or genic waste, how to utilize the plant? Okay. So, uh, like I, I give the presentation that uh, mostly in the experiment, we use one fall per centi. So it means one fall centi, uh, we measure is uh, uh, how long between of the electrode for the anode the cathode. For example, if we put uh, the anode the cathode uh, within the one meters, so mean we can apply maximum for 100. 100 fall because we can make a one fall per centi, for example. But at, uh, one of the problem, the electrokinetic remediation process is uh, rising of the temperatures in the soils. Uh, this is also the issue in the electrokinetic remediation. So that's why uh, for the application I saw in some paper in the Korea and in the Taiwan, they never use 100 falls. Uh, they usually uh, using the the voltage per meter square, voltage per meter square of the soils. So means that they can use a, a small voltage uh, with the large area, for example. And then for the photomodulation, yeah, there is some issues about the plant that have been used uh, used for the photomodulation because the the plant uh, already absorbs some pollutants. So, for example, uh, we can use the plant as the phyto mining. For example, we take the plant that already contains some heavy metals, then we burn the plants. Yeah, we burn the plants, then we got the ash, and and then we can extract the heavy metal from the ash using the like the hydrochloric acid, for example. This is one of the examples, one of the options. Uh, today in the Fukushima area, they are already using the phytoremediation using the sunflower. They taking the uh, cesium and they harvest the sunflower and they keep in the proper rooms uh, until they can remove the radioactive cesium from the uh, sunflower uh, material, for example. Okay, thank you. And the last question, uh, any feedback from uh, Dr. Rafi? Yeah, it's okay, it's enough. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, move. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we move to the last question from Uwin Sofiani. What types of plants are most optimal in the phytoremediation process? He said seasonal factor are there any factor that can decrease phytoremediation activity? For example, the age of plants. Uh, uh, that's enough, uh, Dr. Rudy. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, today, so many, so many phytoremediation papers. Uh, one of the prestigious journal, International Journal of Phytoremediation. So you can read many reports in the journals, uh, maybe more than 300 species today they can use for the phytoremediation. But uh, for most specialists, uh, heavy metal, for example, the cesium. For example, sunflower is the very stable plant they can use for uh, taking the cesium from the soil, for example. Other, other species, uh, added for the example, uh, Brasisca, for example, I already used that uh, and give you presentation this morning uh, mm -hmm. for the remove the lead, for example. So 
uh, because uh, the, the study of the fatal mutation is already takes long time, uh, maybe more than 60 years. So they already make uh, many library about what kind of the, uh, of the plant that can be used suitable for our, uh, for our study. But I think uh, there is a two kinds of the plant that can be used for fatal mutation. One is a floating water plants. Uh, I mean, uh, for like a changondok, kayu apu, for example, kiambang, so macropites that uh, easy to find around of the our environment. The second is the using the hydroponic system. So the hydroponic system we can use uh, this system whatever kind of the plant, uh, then we can uh, observe how the plant can grow uh, in the, our experiment. And other thing is the ecotypes. Mean uh, how we can try to use the plant that already uh, already grows in the uh, near the pollution condition. This is the pollution area, and then we can select up that kind plant and use of our experiment. And the fourth things maybe if we can make relationship with the biology department, for example, we can make an engineer plants. So we can produce the plant that can absorb many uh, heavy metal, for example. And the factor of the plant that can grow is uh, depending on the bioavailability of the plants for the pollutants, I think so. Uh, some of the monocotyl plants, like the big plants, they can grow more than 10 years. But in my experiment, we, we just using the decotyl plants, means uh, the plant that uh, just only for using for maximum for 40 days. According to our experiment, for example, a changondok is only can be used for 14 days. And other the plants uh, is easy to, it's not easy to grow. For example, kayu apu, a changondok, uh, kiambang, and other hydroponic plants, uh, they just only can be used for seven days. Okay, uh, thank you. Any feedback from? Uh, Dr. Uwin, yes, okay. okay. Thank you for, yeah, I think enough. Thank you for okay. the answer and explanation. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, we have several minutes uh, and we still have two questions for Dr. Lem Tong. Maybe uh, Dr. Lem Tong can answer it shortly because our time is limited. Yeah, of course, of course. Um... So the number four characterization, yeah, it's kind of complaint, right? <laughs> yeah, of course. I mean, so uh, because we are the uh, material chemists, so we could not avoid um, to do characterization, especially for the with the good techniques or with the sophisticated technique. We could not avoid it, of course. Of course, as a reminder, the characterization costs are expensive. Yeah, I know about that and I recognize this as well. But um, if you could actually do, uh, have done the research, you can start from some simple project and you can have the output like a, a, a small publication first and later on you will get more funding and funding. And of course, I mean, you will earn more money and then you will have enough money for characterization. But don't give up now. Don't to do the characterization. You have to do anyway. If you have no shy, if you have no machine in your own institute, you can do the con uh, a direct contact. And you can also do collaboration like what I do with uh, Professor Fatima as well. And uh, because so sometimes, so and often, so we, because we are like a, um, so to say, um, not really developed countries who actually have uh, every sophisticated equipment. But of course, I mean, we can still do, do research. But if we can do the good research, starting from good research, and of course, I mean, they will give us more money. Yeah, so let's start from, from good collaboration, I think. Uh, I, I hope uh, the number four, I answer quite well, right? <laughs> Maybe I have to ask Fatima as well <laughs> to discuss about this, <laughs> okay. And number five, uh, what is the optimum heating temperature for optimum value for the BT? Well, it really depends on the precursor that you use. 
Uh, maybe sometimes you don't need to go beyond 500, but sometimes you can also, uh, for hydrothermal carbonization, you can also do at lo much lower temperature. It depends on the instrument that you employ also. It also depends on the precursor that you use also. You have to, to, to simply do trial and error. I could not say in this case, but of course it also depends on um, the chemicals or the um, characteristic of your own precursor as well. Yeah. I think it's, it's uh, I answer all the question, right? Okay, uh, I think enough, Dr. Uh, Ramton. <clears throat> and uh, finally, uh, I just a little bit to talk to Dr. Lamton. Okay, yeah. okay, please, Dr. Uti. Oh, Dr. Lamton, I'm uh, very pleased if we can join, make some study. Of course, of course. If it's possible, I think we I can use of your material for my PRB experiment, exactly. for example. Really willing to do so. And I'm quite fascinated with your uh, experiment with uh, water hyacinth as well. Yes. If you can I, do will, I will send you some email to talk later. Yeah, of course. And then we can make some conversation. Yeah, especially for the uh, water hyacinth route is quite interesting because you can do phytoremediation if you can actually entrap something into yeah. the root of water hyacinth, for example, the iron species or cobalt or nickel, we can actually convert into some other things stuff. Yes, yes. Yeah, would be interesting. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, yeah. That's <laughs> yeah, we, we already start collaboration, yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Rudy and Dr. Lam Song. Uh, actually, uh, there is still a question, but we hope that Dr. Lam Tong can uh, type in the type the answer in the text in the chat box because our time is limited. Okay, uh, and the finally, before we close this webinar, uh, the committees would like to share the certificate to both uh, speakers. Here's the certificate. Uh, do you see the screen, yes. Dr. Rudy? Okay. Yes. <laughs> this is a, a certificate of appreciation to Associate Professor Rudy Shahputra, PhD, as a speaker in this webinar. And once again, we say thank you to Dr. Rudy Shahputra. Thank you very much. And the second certificate we give to. Dr. Lam Song Chen Chong. Okay, this is Lam. our yeah, our appreciation to the Dr. Lam Song as the speaker yeah. in this webinar. Once again, thank you, Dr. Lam Song. Yeah, thanks. Uh, terima kasih. Yeah. Terima kasih kembali. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have reached at 12 o'clock. This is the last session of our webinar. Uh, uh, before we close this webinar, I would like to inform to the all participants that e-certificate will be sent by email in this day. Okay. Uh, once again, we say thank you to all speakers and also all participants for active participating this webinar. And uh, let's we close this session with reciting Alhamdulillah. 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 Uh, uh, from me, I think enough. And I close this session. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So, thank, thank you very much, Pak Rudy. <laughs> Lemtong, thank you. Ah, thanks a lot, Fatima. Yeah. Terima kasih Bu Iswatima. Ye, sama-sama Bu Dia. Ya. Ya, terima kasih Bu Dia. Cicik Bu. Thank you Dr. Falah Safik.